All right, everybody, we are live on the YouTubes. I'm Stalman Smith Jr. for The Unapologetic Apologist. My co-host is John Dunphy. He's, <laughs> why did he change his name to Trinity Radio? I just left the last minute. Because <laughs> I'm throwing, at Trinity Radio right now. <laughs> it's throwing me off already. Very, <laughs> mm, excuse me, excited to have my two guests deflating. Atheism, Braxton Hunter, thank you for being here, gentlemen. Thank you. And Glad to be here. Thank you so much for having us, Stalman. This is a true honor and a privilege. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I apologize that we are, are starting late to everybody out there. We were discussing flat earthers and uh, faking the moon landing. So, you know, always a uh, very fun conversation. So today is actually a debate review of Jordan Peterson versus Susan Blackmore on the unbelievable uh, program asking the question, do we need God to make sense of life? And so I guess we can jump right into it here. I have two kind of preliminary clips I'm going to play. First is Jordan Peterson kind of setting up his worldview, then Susan setting up uh, her worldview, and then we'll get into the comment. But so I will go ahead and add this to the stream. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to say uh, I'm having a thunderstorm over here. So if I cut out, you'll know why. Okay. Okay. Thanks for letting us know. Do you see yourself at least in the Christian tradition as far as your, I suppose, worldview. Well, there's no, well, there's no doubt about that because I'm a Westerner. There's, mm. there's no escape from that. Yeah. I'm conditioned in every cell to, from as a consequence of the Judeo-Christian worldview. And so I, I've read a fair bit in other religious traditions and have a, a reasonable grasp on some of them, I would say, not trying to overestimate my knowledge, um, but it, we're saturated in Judeo-Christian ethics. And so... I've seen you say that you certainly live your life as though God exists. Yes, I would say, well, to the best of my ability, mm. right? Yeah, and I think that that's the fundamental hallmark of belief is what you, it's how you act, not right. what you say about what you think you think. Sure. What do you know about what you think? Mm. Seriously, I mean, mm. we wouldn't need a psychology, yeah, yeah. an anthropology, a sociology, <laughs> any of this, any of the humanities if if our thoughts were transparent to ourselves. They're not in the least. And you've well, been in the least they are, but you've been. All right, so that's the first clip. Um, and so that's just Jordan Pearson kind of setting up his stuff. And I don't have too much to say about it at this particular moment because it's going to kind of come out more throughout the debate. But a lot of people like to kind of accuse Jordan Peterson of more of a pragmatism. It's just more kind of pragmatic to live his life. I do think it is deeper than that. But uh, Braxton, what, what do you want, want to say about this? Yeah, so obviously the first thing that um, that would jump out at an evangelical like myself would be, okay, look, especially people doing what we do in apologetics and things like that. And I know that not everyone here is an evangelical, but to someone like me, it jumps out with, okay, when you say, well, of course I'm a Christian, I, I live in the West or I was raised in the West. The response uh, that most quickly comes to the mind as a knee jerk reaction is, well, what you're, what you're describing is sort of a, um, a cultural Christianity or a, um, uh, it, it's like, a, it's like you're a part of Christendom. But does that mean that you are in any sense um, meaningfully a Christian in an orthodox sense of the term? Uh, but I think that's going to I think that question uh, of what exactly Jordan Peterson means is something that perhaps we can unfold more later on. As he moves on, I think he makes a really relevant point about, um, look, if you if you your beliefs are going to show up in how you behave, right, how you act is going to demonstrate your beliefs and. You know, one of the things that I've often thought about, I think that is certainly true. And in fact, one thing that he says in this, and I'm not trying to go on too long. I'll try to be brief here. But good. when I think about um, things that he says elsewhere in this very video, he says, um, we aren't, we, it is, oh, he said it in that clip. We don't have access to our own beliefs like we think we do. We don't have the level of, I don't know how he said it exactly, but the specificity of our own psychology to the degree that we think we do. And if we did, of course, psychologists might be out of a job. We, so, you know, the, the thing about it is, um, when I look at myself and this could actually maybe help someone who experiences doubt and say, do I really believe that, uh, Christianity is true? Um, that, that God exists like ontologically and all those kind of things. What comes to my mind is, well, Braxton, uh, do you fear God? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Sorry, by the way, atheists, uh, we're Christians expects us to say Christian stuff, but yeah, I fear God and I feel the conviction of the Holy spirit and I try to manipulate my life to conform to what God wants. So even though I do that imperfectly, that propensity to do that demonstrates to me that I do believe even when I'm in the midst of, uh, moments of doubt. Uh, conversely, though, 
And I'd like to get you all's take on this. Um, I know, I believe intellectually that if I would just go to the gym or if I would just take the fork out of my mouth, that I would be, I would, I would be in better shape. I would lose weight. I would be more physically attractive to my wife. I know all these things are true intellectually, but I don't do them. Uh, so in what sense there do we say that my behavior uh, demonstrates my belief? I think what we could say at the very least is in that moment, I believed that I would be happier with the fork in my mouth or something. But I think these are interesting concepts. Those are some of my initial thoughts. Yeah, uh, Mr. Deflating Atheism, or, or as I know you, the John, Jonathan Lithgow with beautiful hair. Uh, oh, what, do you, what do you think about it? Well, we, uh, Braxton, we've been trying to tell you to go to the gym, but I'm glad you've, you've come to the organization <laughs> by yourself, you know. I'm aware. But uh, uh, I've always had this problem with Jordan Peterson. I could never quite get to the bottom of this kind of interpretation of faith or, or of Christian belief. I mean, I'll, I'll gladly agree that, that Christianity is not just a bundle of propositions. But there, there you have to assent at some point to some propositions to be a Christian. It can't just be a matter of acting out. That, that seems very alien to me. And if you say, you know, we don't have necessarily access to our own beliefs, and well, how can we say that we're acting in, the court, in accordance with them? So that's all very confusing to me. So I'm... You know, I'm just admitting right now I have difficulty with this concept that, that yeah. Peterson often throws out. Yeah. So, so Dunphy, I'll kick, kick it to you real quick. Um, but what I would say is, I, I'm as we and as we get into more of this, I'm convinced that what Jordan Peterson, even though he one might not explicitly say, I believe, for example, Christ rose from the dead, he definitely thinks that there's an objective foundation out there that grounds his actions. So I don't think he's just drawing complete separation between here's what you say about what you think and then here's what you act as if it's true because that would be kind of a pure prag pragmatism. But he's saying, hey, I'm acting on something that does have an objective foundation um, that he just might not explicitly call that Christianity. But Dunphy, what do you think? Yeah, so when uh, you know I'm a Western, those are just my values. I almost agree with them that people are raised Christian and it's a title and they think it's a lifestyle until real serious decisions that come up where they actually have to apply their beliefs. Some are just completely unaware of it and then some are self-conscious of it and it becomes inconvenience for them. So I'm, I'm more of the cynic. Sorry. Um, I'm more of the cynic when it comes to this type of topic because I think people deep down when they're faced with real moral choices, they show who they really are and what their will truly yields to, towards and up. They're a Christian when it's convenient for them, and then uh, when it's not, they let go of it. But um, yeah, I'm sort of an existentialist when it comes to that, not the psychologist or uh, someone who just looks at it purely philosophical. Right on. Yeah. So let me this then real quick. This is Susan setting up her worldview. I interrupted. <laughs> but let's come to you, Sue. Um, you may be familiar to some unbelievable listeners who have already heard you on the show before. Um, you, I think you're happy to describe yourself as an atheist. Does Indeed. that mean for you that you are? a naturalist, someone who's committed to a view that our experiences can be fully explained by a purely material world? N no, I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, I sign up in a way to naturalism uh, groups and, 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 and beliefs, but because I work on consciousness such a lot and the problem of how do we relate the mind body problem, you know, here's this table, here's my glass of water. We'll agree that if I go like this, it'll go all over the place. And ruin the microphone. Uh, and ruin the microphone. <laughs> uh, how does that relate to my the taste of the water that you know these fundamental problems mean i have big queries about naturalism as you described it there okay in a much broader sense yes um as you know and many listeners will know i started out being a parapsychologist and rejected ideas of clairvoyance and telepathy and ghosts and poltergeist because of lack of evidence so that's one way to naturalism to throw that lot out um i was brought up like like you as a Christian. Um, and I threw that out because in the end, it didn't make sense to me. So that's another way to say mm. I'm left with naturalism, but I'm not left with a naturalism that explains everything. I'm left with a feeling that that's what I want to try to do to understand what's going on here in minds, in bodies, in tables and glasses of water. And it's very difficult. You're well. So... There's that. So I, I appreciate that kind of intellectual humility. We're saying, well, I, I'm not claiming naturalism can explain everything. But, you know, Braxton, one of the things you often point out on your show is, you know, the atheists will kind of say, well, I'm more of a lack of belief type person. But then, and she and later in this episode goes on to make these positive claims. Well, religion is just a virus of the mind or I can throw it away as like a fairy tale or something. So 
what's your what's your take on her description of her naturalism? So first of all, on the point you just made, I, this only occurred to me like a couple of months ago, but I want to make a video on it at some point because I, you know, William Lane Craig and others will always try to say, look, don't let the atheist avoid their own burden of proof. Um, it took me a while to get to the place where I realized a very simple way of demonstrating that most of them have a burden of proof um, in an obvious way. Um, and that is, they'll say something like, well, no, I'm, I'm totally open to it. I'm, I'm waiting to be convinced or whatever. But then later in other comments, uh, when they're being more casual, perhaps they'll say it's like Santa Claus or it's like the Easter bunny or it's just magic or it's whatever. Well, those you're betraying there that you actually actively disbelieve. It's not just that you lack a belief, you actively disbelieve or else you wouldn't be making those positive claims. So you, if you want to sit at the grownups table and have a conversation about worldview issues, you can sit at the grownups table in a couple of ways as an atheist. Either you can you can make all those comments. The mockery doesn't bother us. You can make all the comments about uh, like it's like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and it's magic. Um, if you're willing to then set up a, a case that atheism is true. But if you're going to do this lack theism thing, then, OK, you can sit at the grownups table, but we shouldn't expect to find you making these comments that are positive claims because then it's hard to take you seriously because you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Um, but I don't. So I, I'll have to wait and see the, the portion that you're mentioning where she does that um, based on what she just said there. Uh, I, it was difficult to follow. I mean, I think I know what she's saying, but um, first of all, I, I'm a bit annoyed that ev not annoyed at her, but just annoyed in general that no matter how we try to define naturalism, um, the atheist in question much of the time is going to take issue with how we define it. And if it's that hard to define, maybe you guys need to do better expressing your, your uh, naturalism. But she's saying here about naturalism that, that as he described it, she's not wild about it because um, she let, let me see if I can steel man this. She, she's saying it's uh, I, I tend to function in my work. At, I'm, I'm looking for a materialistic explanation. I think that most of the paranormal type stuff and religious stuff probably isn't the case. But since I deal with consciousness, I can't be, a, you know, ironclad about that. Um, but I'm looking for it sounds like sh I'm reading her saying I'm looking for a solution to this problem uh, via materialism. And so uh, I, I, I at the end of the day, I'm still not sure where she is. I, I want to say maybe she is taking kind of a lack of belief about uh, the immaterial, but it's very difficult to, to see it clearly for me. Um, so I guess I just don't have much more than that to say about it. I, I, I can't, it wasn't 100 percent clear. Yeah. Mr. Lithgow, what, what's your take here? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're going, it, it sounds like she's trying to have her cake and eat it too. I mean, she says she's not expressing a, a, a you know, assenting to naturalism and saying that there's only the natural exists. Well, then why even bring it up in the first place? So it, it does sound, I'm going to agree with Braxton, that she wants to kind of have the kind of naturalism cake without the uh, burden of actually having to prove it, which is, it's uh, in, in, principle unprovable really so yeah i don't really know what you can do with that as far as what you were saying about uh the the lack theism and and having a burden of proof uh, often to justify uh the the lack of belief atheism they'll assert as a matter of fact that there is no evidence for god now that's a claim that's a truth claim that in itself carries a burden of proof so yeah i'm just throwing that out too good point yeah, that's a great point dunphy so I think because of postmodern culture and society and Western thought, not even Western thought, just modern uh, culture, I think we give ourselves too much reliability or in our in our own intuition of what seems convincing or you know what actually appears to be a lack of evidence to me. So I think because of that, we get skeptics where at one point, yeah, there's no evidence for ghosts or, or fairies or whatnot, but you know when it comes to consciousness. They just say, oh, well, that's mysterious on my worldview. So I'm not a naturalist not in that sense. I'm not a naturalist because I'm, I, I just don't think my mind is just my brain. So and there's there was almost some sort of sense of duality there. But I'm just going to appeal to mystery, not know. But, you but you know, theism is, is, isn't, isn't true and Christianity isn't because, you know, there's no evidence. So I, I, I think Rob is right there in pointing out. Um, uh, John, no John just reminded me of something that she said. She said that the reason she got rid of the um the christianity was because it didn't make sense to her now i'm sure she would have more to say about that if we were to probe that but there are a lot of things that are true that i believe are true that don't make sense to me um quantum superposition makes absolutely no sense to me 
but I believe it's probably true. You know, I, there are a lot of things I believe that don't make sense. Some your incredulity about a thing does not an argument make. Yeah. I, I mean, it happens all the time. That an atheist can grill you. Oh well, you know, this Bible verse says this, and this appears to be a contradiction to me. Uh, there, it could say, I don't know. You know, it doesn't make. But I find uh, on the weight of the evidence, there's enough uh, evidence to believe in the God of the Bible. That doesn't mean I have to be able to answer every single question about it. Yeah, I, I, I tell you what I think credulity is. I think they are assumptions that are not open to change. And those are your presuppositions. And when you have that presupposition, your beliefs will just follow that. And then they won't be open to change, even though you think you're actually open to change because you have a high view of yourself. But uh, that's just my my uh, my view, at least. Yeah. yeah. So let me bring this back in. So this, this is a, a longer clip. Uh, this is a, a roughly uh, four minutes. Um, and yeah, there's, so there's a lot of things that get brought up in here. And so there might be a, a so if I to say, wait, wait, pause, I want to address it. But I did list them out here. So we'll be able to get to all of them once the clip is over. With See, I do believe that the biblical texts are foundational. Mm. I believe it in the Nietzschean sense. And, you know, Nietzsche, of course, announced famously in the late 1800s, 1800s that God was dead. And the typical rationalist atheist regards that as a triumphalant, triumphalist proclamation. But that wasn't that for Nietzsche. And Nietzsche knew perfectly well and said immediately afterward that the consequences of that was going to be bloody catastrophe because mm. everything was going to fall. And he predicted the rise of communism, for example, and the deaths of tens of millions of people in the aftermath of the death of God. Because Nietzsche knew perfectly well that when you pull the cornerstone out from underneath a building, that even though it may stay aloft in midair like a cartoon character that's wandered off a cliff for some period of time, that it will inevitably crumble mm. and that it will be replaced by something that's perhaps far worse. Now, Nietzsche hoped it would be it would be replaced by man's ability to recreate meaning spontaneously out of his psyche, for example, which I think is a doomed enterprise. But he knew that in the interval, it would be replaced by both nihilism and by communist totalitarianism, which is but a hell of a prediction because it it was done like 40 years before the events actually unfolded. Well, so, you, can, you, you can see it that way. But if that is the case, why do we have evidence that the most um, dysfunctional societies today are the most religious? And, for example, in the United States of America, the higher, if you go across different states, the higher belief in God is proclaimed belief in God, whatever you think that means. Um, the, the more uh, murders, suicides, marital breakdown, um, various measures of dysfunctional society are. Well, it depends on how you define religion in part. I mean, first of all, America is a very religious country. Mm. And to think of it as a country that's doing worse than other countries in the world is just not the case Well, its at incarceration all. rate is higher than any other... Well, true, but so uh, is its standard society. of living and, and, its, and its, what would you say, ability to provide the basic essentials of life for people and, and the essential freedoms that go along with that. You wouldn't compare well, that to an African it's, dictatorship. No, example. no, no. But most of these studies have been done only in developed societies. But there, if you look at income inequality, that's much worse in the States. So, yes, a lot of people in the States have a very high standard of living, but the poorest are really poor. Yes. Yeah, well, in, really income in, in, in and, you know, with, with yes. Obamacare being dismantled and so on. Well, but, but nevertheless, let me go back to that point. We know that more dysfunctional societies have higher proclaimed belief, higher attendance in church and so on. Now, this doesn't fit with what you were saying. Now, Nietzsche's ideas are very profound and interesting, but I just want to stop you from saying that he was absolutely right about somehow if, if we get rid of God, <laughs> we're going to be worse because we have very well-functioning societies well, we were pretty We were pretty example. bad in the 20th century. Oh, we were, yes, yes. people were. And, but, and, we, and we could easily drift that way again. And there have been terrible bad things done in the name of God, and there have been terrible bad things done in the name of communism and, 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 and atheism. I don't think we can I don't so you, want to you don't weigh think them the up. God, the God. I'll weigh them up. You'll weigh, weigh them up, up and you'll no say problem. no problem. But then Let's you give, have to give, go against this evidence that we'll, I've we'll just give, stated. Jordan, come back on this evidence. Okay, so I didn't actually plan to pause it here, but so there's a there's a there's a lot there. Um and uh deflating atheism, I saw you smiling, so I do want to kick it to you first. But like one thing that strikes me with like what what whatever regardless of what study study she's citing, like not all religions are created equal. So for example, if you're talking if you're including Islam in all religions and then comparing that to just like purely secular states, which by and large are founded on a, on a Christian ethic. It's like, well, of course you're going to have more violence there, but it's like, that's just an equivocation. That's just completely unreasonable. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of uh, evidence that you have to kind of, 
I, there are a lot of complicating factors. I mean, a lot of times they'll point to uh, like Scandinavian countries, which have an apparent lack of uh, you know crime or something. Well, Scandinavian countries had state churches up until very recently. So, you know, it, it depends on what are the uh, relevant aspects you want to consider. Also, I think uh, I, I mentioned in my comment kind of snarkily that uh, all those uh, supposed, you know, enlightened blue states like, like you know, Oregon and, you know, Washington, they're not looking too good these days. So, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you know, secular, secular countries and secular states and, you know, Maybe they, they do kind of coast off of a, a Christian ethic, and then they're kind of like Wiley e. Coyote going over the cliff. Yeah. Braxton, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, some good stuff there, um, relevant stuff that I think he's right. I, I would also say that um, it's my understanding that uh, a case can be made that some of these countries, and I'm not, I'm not the guy to go to on these sort of foreign policy, political type discussions, but you know, a lot of these countries are able to pour more money into other sorts of things like education because America is basically policing much of the world and doing that their job for them there. And so if America were to put an iron dome over ourselves and just um, pour all our money into these other things, it might it might it might look a little bit differently. But I think the fundamental point that needs to be brought out is what he said, which is simply that um and I think Peterson points this out later in the discussion is that you are number one, writing off of um, y your Christian forebears. And I didn't know that, that there was a, ch a, a church government basically until recently, but that even furthers and defines the point. Uh, lastly, I would say about that clip is that um, I thought, you know, it was because of Jordan Peterson largely that I, um, over the past couple of years, have read both. Um, Dostoyevsky's *The Brothers Karamazov* and *Crime and Punishment*, and I have to tell you, it, you can't—you can hardly listen to a Jordan Peterson book. There they are. <laughs> you can hardly listen to a Jordan Peterson um, discussion without him bringing up *Crime and Punishment*. He's also mentioned *Brothers Karamazov*, and uh, Dostoyevsky was said to have been a Christian, but like the worst one you'd ever meet. Um, so, it, it, uh, but I can tell you in crime and punishment specifically, you see the depths of depravity and of guilt and shame. And if you want to read something that kind of impresses our moral categories and how they're there for people that don't think they're there, uh, crime and punishment does a good job of illustrating that. But in with, but on this literary thread, we, you know, Nietzsche, he's right about Nietzsche and Sartre, of course, um, tried to talk he was, you know, a lot of the atheists today say, well, you no, know, there's no intrinsic or ultimate meaning, but we can we can develop a meaning for ourselves and, and that sort of thing. That's going to be the thing that holds the building up whenever God has been ripped out from underneath it. But um, I, I just don't there are multiple problems with that that would require its own show. But I mean, first off, it, it's uh, worthwhile to point out that people have different meanings that are in conflict with each other. And so the, the Christian, the Judeo-Christian principles that people are running off of, even in some of these European countries that they're talking about, and they aren't even aware. The Christian principles that YouTube atheists are running off of, that they aren't even aware or will not admit, are Christian principles. Um, we were just talking before the show started about Tom Holland, um, the historian who uh, mentioned when he was on with N.T. Wright on Unbelievable, mentioned that um, th this whole thing about the uh, s there's something noble and honorable about being uh, the person who is oppressed, that there's something heroic about being courageous in the midst of oppression. Yeah, that's a, that's a Christian thing. Uh, back in back in the Roman Empire, you'd say, well, I'm being oppressed. Yeah, you're darn right you are. And you better realize that's your status in life. That is something that Christianity largely gave to the world. And so a lot of the fundamental uh, drives and principles that we have and that atheists have come to us from Christianity. And I think that undergirds the point that he's making. Yeah, that's great. And Dunphy, I will bring you in here in a, mi in a minute, but I, I do need to finish playing the clip. I didn't plan to stop it, there, but I, I want to finish playing it real quick before I make the points that I had written down. I mean, obviously, from her perspective, Sue feels like actually we've, we've got pretty stable societies that are increasingly secular these days. So perhaps Nietzsche was wrong. And in fact, we're not going to see this. Moral, well, I would say they're, they're stable to the degree that they're actually not secular. And this is also a Nietzschean observation and a Dostoevsky observation for that matter is that we're living on the corpse of our ancestors like we always have. That's a very old idea. Mm. But that, run, you, that, runs, that stops being nourishing and starts to become rotten unless you replenish it. 
And I don't think we are replenishing it. We're in danger of running. We're living on borrowed time and in danger of running out of it. Um, I like I I think that the reason that the Western societies essentially work quite well is because they act out a Judeo-Christian ethic and one that's essentially predicated. It's predicated on um, utmost regard for the sovereignty of the individual. So the individual is sovereign in relationship to the state, which is a remarkable idea and one that's fundamentally religious in its in its in its essence. In my motive mode of thinking and that's also predicated on honest speech and there's there's other predi predicates at all as well but those are religious predicates in my estimation there's a section actually sue so so, so there's a couple points so first when you talk about these studies you can't just jump from all religious societies are worse than second ones to specific ones within the united states because specific ones within the united states regardless of when you look at state by state which ones proclaim higher belief or not the entirety of the West is built on, for example, what Jordan Pearson talked about, the sovereignty of the individual, certain rights that are given by God and not by government. So to his point, the, the so-called secular states are, are stable to the point that they're not actually secular, that they are thriving on this. Um, and I'm, one of my favorite lines that Jordan Pearson said, she's like, I don't want to count up the corpses between evil done in the name of religion versus evil done in the name, name of atheism. And Jordan Pearson was like, I'll stack them up. I will. And this is a criticism I hear often from the atheist types. They'll say, well, it's not fair to look at something like Stalin or these kinds of things because they were be behaving in a quasi-religious manner, not a truly secular way. But this is where we get to the uncomfortable truth for the ath atheists. Whether they liked it or not, for Stalin, his atheism was an ism. It was a quasi-religion for him. And the point was, is that if there's no ar overarching moral authority, well, then guess what? His isms can be whatever they want it, what, whatever he wants them to be. And so he can use them uh, to his point. Um, and to what is his point about Nietzsche is purpose is built into us as part of our telos, right? We have to have a purpose. And if you strip uh, a proper religious structure out from of that, well, guess what? then where the heck are we going to get our purposes? But I can tell you this, it's not going to be any place good and because you can't just completely get rid of that instinct for purpose from humanity. And then real quick, last thing I'll say is, I realize there's an equiv equivocation going on here to say religious societies are worse than atheist ones because what the atheist ones do is they want to take Christianity and then throw it into the category of all the other religions like Islam, which yes, of course, there's a lot more violence there. Um, but then what they want to do is they want to steal from Christianity the good parts to build their secular societies on and they say, well, look how good our secular societies are compared to the religious ones. But it's, they're only good because they've stolen it from Christianity. Excellent point. Dunphy, I didn't let you speak last time. Do you want to go? Yeah, so I wanted to address when she was, you know, bringing up, oh, America has the highest incar incarceration rates and all this good stuff. Um, I mean, bad stuff. So one, I don't think that's based on Judeo-Christian values. I think that's based on the American dream ethical system, which is legalism, which is uh, due according to the law. And uh, when it comes to actual virtue ethics, you know, basic Aristotelian ideas of virtues like uh, courage, temperance, candor, all, all, all those virtues that Aristotle talks about, people are not virtuous because it's not part of the law that they have to uphold. So they will get away with uh, being evil almost or viceful when it suits their benefits so friendship is not a virtue in america um that that's mostly an eastern tradition when you look at the medievals and the greeks and so on i think because of this uh we we get all these tragedies they they talk about because virtue ethics isn't held up and isn't that at least taught to be valuable while just upholding the law and living your own life and being your own god almost your own idol is a corruption of you know what I think the founding fathers won based on Judeo-Christian values, and I think that's what we have nowadays. And that's not Christianity or religion. That's just leaving the individual to themselves to make those decisions independent of truth and virtue and God, quite frankly. Yeah, that's a good point. So I'm going to jump right into this next clip here. And this, to your point earlier, Rob, I think this is a, a good clip um, where Jordan Peterson's going beyond just it's a pragmatic way of, of acting to there, there's something objective uh, in reality, as that serves as a foundation. In Jordan's book, where he says this, Christianity elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master, commoner and nobleman alike, on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. It's nothing short of a miracle. Um, he has a very 
high view of what Christianity has done for the world, whether or not it's objectively true. Yeah. What, yes, do you, what do you take from it? Well, uh, that evidence that I was dis discussing earlier, that there's plenty of now, that the most dysfunctional societies are also the most believing societies. There are lots of hypotheses about why that is the case. But I would like to challenge Jordan on the implication that he put before, that because a lot of these um, of, of, our, of our moral stance today comes from religion and not all of it does that that it has to have that as a basis i don't think it does i feel very grateful to live in a country where now at last the majority uh, are not religious it's just tipped over in the latest polls and in fact coming up on the train from devon today i got chatting with various people the assumption that i find here i don't know what it's like in canada is i always start with assuming someone's an atheist and it nearly always turns out to be there oh yeah all that religion stuff you know it's very very common in this country now we have not descended into being a terrible country um we have you know yes we have our problems we're but still people's... fairly early on in the in the experiment, I suppose, of ditching well, God. Well, like about yes. 10 years. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I will awake with interest and hope I live long enough to see. But then if we look at many of the Scandinavian countries, which are way ahead of us in, the, in that move, they have wonderful um, uh, health systems, um, welfare state, support for people out okay. of work well, and so on. I, I'd be really interested in hearing your response to all this then, Jordan. D ultimately, we can divorce the, the good principles that we may have had in some respects from religion, from religion ultimately, and still leave Yes. perfectly happy well it depends lives. see a lot of this depends on your definition of religion like i know perfectly well from my own empirical studies that there's at least two disparate sets of phenomena that might be regarded as religious right there's the dogmatic element which is really what sue's referring to when she talks about the pathology of religious belief and there's the spiritual element and the dogmatic element tends to appeal to people who are essentially conservative in their temperamental nature and i mean that scientifically speaking and the um, meaningful element, the, the spiritual element, let's say, tends to um, appeal to people who are more liberal in their in their uh, temperamental fundamentals. And religion overall is a continual dialogue between the dogmatic element and the spiritual element. And if either of those exceeds its proper boundaries, then there's a degenerative consequence. Okay. Like if the spiritual types get the upper hand, then the structure disappears. And if the dogmatic types get the upper hand, then everything clamps down into too much stasis. So to, to make a, a, a direct claim, say, between the existence of dogmatic belief and the pathology of society, and then to assume that that encompasses the entire relationship between religion and the functioning of society, I think is a, based upon a narrowing of, an unfortunate narrowing of the definition of what constitutes religious. But then back to the idea that our moral claims can be divorced from the religious substrate. It mm. depends on what you mean, and here we go with the definition, by moral substrate, you know, the, the, or, or religious substrate. Let's say that I regard you as um, a sovereign individual. Well, the question is, what does that mean? It might just be an opinion. It might just be a meme. It might be reflective of something far deeper, so deep that if we transgress against it, it will be fatal. And my investigations have convinced me that that's exactly the case that although it may be a rational claim it may be an enlightenment claim as well that there's something underneath it that's so much deeper than that that to reduce it to mere rationality or to mere enlightenment claim is to do it an immense disservice and also to fall prey i would say to the postmodern quandary because the postmodern quandary is um all belief systems are equally invalid. It's something like that. Mm. And that's a real problem when you try to erect a belief system on purely rational axioms. So, and you can't, besides that, you, you can't even do it. It's like, I don't respect you as an individual for rational means. The rationality didn't precede my respect for you. It's way deeper than that. So, yeah, so that's what I, I really like that clip from Jordan Pearson, because here he's saying it's not just an opinion. It's not just based on rationality. There's something far, far deeper than that. Um, but so, Braxton, I do want to turn it over to you first. Yeah, and Rob hasn't gotten to speak in a while, so he, he should get a chance here, I think. But um, I, I think uh, he, going back to the what do we mean by religion? Right. Because I actually know and this is this is a pretty shallow point, but I think it's a meaningful one. Um, when we're talking about the general population, um, it, if I if I polled a church on Sunday morning, let's take a non-denominational evangelical church on Sunday morning and ask them, are they religious? I would get people back who are very committed to that church who would say they are not religious. And the reason they would say they are not religious is because at least in the United States and in that sort of a church, 
religion, ha there's been so much of this, uh, and I'm sorry, nonsense about it's a, it's a relationship, not a religion. Well, it, those two things are not mutually exclusive. And I think the person wants to say that because they, they hear the term religion and they think that it somehow is um, a, a negative or denigrating term or puts Christianity on par with other false religions or something like that. But the reality is it is a religion. Christianity is a religion. It, it does involve a relationship, but it is a religion. But because of things like that, you won't even get all Christians to put down that 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 they're religious. On, on top of that, there are people who who believe that Christianity is true, um, and yet aren't a part of a local assembly. Um, whatever we want to say about the status of their salvation or whether they're in Christ, um, that person might put that they're not religious. I'm sorry, not all of the nuns are not religious, and that's uh, an important thing. So th those things I think um, uh, need need to be uh, stated as well. But then on the point that he keeps coming back to, and I think was the real thing you wanted to comment on, which is um, whether this this substrate here um, is you know, if it, it seems like it goes much deeper and he's found in his thinking about it, that it does go much deeper. And of course, the four of us would say it does go much deeper and grounded in the nature of God and all those kind of things. But the, but the, the reality is she is still very much experiencing the residue of Christianity, which is a major thrust in this video. She is experiencing that residue of Christianity that keeps things rolling um, so far. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if it was in this clip or the last one, but I did want to say something about it where he says we, we are living off of the corpse of our forebears. And we it's it, we if we don't continue to feed that or fuel that it's going to run out. And I think we are seeing even even, though, you know, America has seemed to be much more of a uh, Christian nation than than um, than than some of the European countries are. Um and I think that that's true when we're talking about Chris and dumb for sure, and probably true in reality. But even here, we're seeing it, that fuel begin to run out. I mean, the, the secularists won't recognize this and liberal Christians and progressive Christians won't recognize this. But what we're seeing happen to our understanding of human sexuality and gender and um, the, the value of the unborn and all of these kind of things are strong evidences that Judeo-Christian values as they as that fuel begins to run out in terms of its cultural currency. We're seeing the society come apart uh, at the seams. And guess what? Even if you think that Christianity is bunk, then you should recognize that a good historical analysis will show you that for the strength of a nation, for the strength of a culture and its survivability, you need the strength of a traditional family unit. It can't just be any kind of family unit, the strength of a family unit. And these things that we're seeing with these social issues um, where it, it is coming apart at the seams, and I think there are other issues aside from social issues, but it's most pronounced there, um, is, is all hitting at the family unit. And so, yeah, that fuel is beginning to run out. And unless you recognize you don't get to just uh, have a subjective meaning and a subjective morality and we can all agree and it's going to be like some sort of a, a liberal or atheist utopia. I'm sorry. No, you need to recognize the truth of the matter. And by the way, this is the only way you can really have a truth of the matter in the sense that we're talking about is that this is deep, as he's saying, and we would say divine ultimately in its foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Lithgow. Well, there's a, there's a lot here to address. Yeah, uh, the clips coming up are much shorter. Okay, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I agree. I, I mean, uh, what Braxton brought up, uh, I, I think you could even improve on that because, I mean, you brought up things like abortion, things that I'm very much opposed to, but you can uh, also bring up things that are, are putative, putatively liberal values, like the, the value of free speech and the value of, of, of political assembly. And we're seeing even things like those topple. I think it's without this this metaphysical framework that 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 uh, Jordan Peterson alludes to, and that like as we said, it's not just the propositions of Christianity; it's the whole metaphysical framework of, as he mentions, like the sovereignty of the individual. Uh, you, you can once you pull those out, even those uh, even those liberal values like free speech, even those can't stand. Now, uh, just kind of going back to the kind of longer discussion about religion, I really don't have uh, much interest in defending religion in general or in the abstract. I'm much more interested in just like you know belief in God, uh, because a religion that's for a, a sociologist to define. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to say that you know 
a religious a religion is necessarily a good thing. It could be you know a, a loyalty to Stalin or something. So sure, Dante. Yeah, I find people who say it's it's a relationship, not a religion, even though it's a relation a religion that involves a relationship, but on a much grander scale. I like Augustine's quote that God is the greatest romance, the greatest the greatest human adventure, the greatest human achievement once it's fulfilled. But um, well, typically they fall under one category where it's this inch deep faith where uh, they've had this religious or emotional experience and the idea of God has helped them and therefore they have a relationship. And it's not a question, it's not open and doubts are ashamed. And then on the other side, you have these Christians who I've talked to where they have much knowledge, much head knowledge, but aren't wise with it. And then, you know, you talk to them about many things about God, even philosophy of time. And then now nowhere they uh, make very, very odd uh, decisions that are against what they affirm. They believe going back to what Jordan Peterson at the very beginning was talking about. Do we really believe what we believe? Because your actions show what you actually believe in your real moral choices. And I find a lot of Christians uh, don't have the best foundation of what faith is. And there's a quote, Jay Warner Wallace, I saw posted where like, faith that can't be trusted isn't faith at all or faith to be trusted and i've seen many christians who have that and we call them lukewarm and i think it's because of um this combination of uh legalism and the sovereignty of the individual now i believe in the sovereignty of the individual and i, I think god has given everyone it's called libertarian free will but i think we emphasize that too much and not and do not say hey go to truth virtue and obviously god since i believe god and all truth is god's truth and go to that to make your moral decisions because uh, there's a there's a hidden assumption I think in Western culture where um, it's this idea of progression where as 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 time goes out you know knowledge obviously progresses and old thinkers we we don't need them anymore. C.S. Lewis has a great essay called uh, Old Books I believe where he talks about the great philosophers and I've been reading Aristotle lately and they they say so much and you can just see where the problem is with many people in their struggles when you just read aristotle's Nic nicomachean ethics and um you know when, when you get into the problem of uh, temperance and self-indulgence versus insensibility and people can't find the middle ground between those vices and they try and create their own and that's what ends up being even worse but um i i think a lack of uh, old books and old readers and con taking considerations into that leads to a lot of the problems that jordan peterson and uh i think susan her, and her name have been talking about and because they keep going with this presupposition, I don't think they will get very far or much common ground, in my view. Yeah, uh, I want to jump back. This is another point I wanted to make. And she's talking about she lives in this in this highly secular society. And in her view, everything is just coming up roses. Well, that's that's a very uh, lazy claim to make when you're living in in, in a largely comfortable middle class society. Uh, you can, it's very easy to say, oh, well, we can all construct our own ethics. You know, that's very easy to say because most people are just going to do the, the risk reward analysis and say, well, it just behooves me just to go along with the rules and not create any waves. But how is that person going to act in the time of crisis? That's when, that's when your foundational beliefs are going to be put to the test. So I don't really have any respect for a person who lives in, in a comfortable middle class or upper mid, upper middle class milieu who says, oh, I can construct my own death. Look, I'm not murdering and raping. So, you know, well, yeah, that's because, you know, it, does, it doesn't benefit you to do that. But how are you going to act in the time of crisis? And I think looking at world events, that time of crisis might be coming uh, sooner rather than later. I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, I think people... And I think a great example is uh, this George Floyd case. And look what happened. Our entire country went crazy over one one's man, one man's injustice, but everything has gone normal. It's almost like uh, that Joker line from The Dark Knight when uh, he's talking to Harvey Dent. You know, uh, take out one little mayor, everyone loses, everyone goes insane. But, you know, people are killed every day. And, you know, abortions happen every day, and that doesn't bat an eye for many people. And Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's because of the culture in postmodern society we live in where things just go normal. And then uh, when actual moral decisions come up, you haven't had that experience and you just fail miserably. And then you make then uh, you, you keep following those same choices. And I think it's because people follow impulses based on their own subject 
subjectivity because we've influenced the sovereignty of the individual too much. And when they go off that impulse, it just creates disaster. And people don't actually care about truth and uh, wisdom, virtue, and all these good good things that God has given and uh, distort those in their misplaced judgments and so on. You know, <clears throat> I just want to jump in. I know, I know we need to move on, but you said a mouthful there, John. I uh, agree 100% with that comment. And it's a difficult one to make with precision right now because everyone's emotions and passions are are up and with good reason. I, look, what happened to George Floyd is a horrific nightmare and should not have happened. Um, and, and and I realize that that uh, we want to recognize the importance of what that means in this time and in this place for African-Americans. Um, and so I, I don't want to detract from that. But at the same time, I do want to say to the leftists who are pro-choice, who are making that point. I, I just want to say back, like, look, I'm glad to hear that you feel this way about the taking of life unjustly. That's a great start. Now, can you help us out with the millions that die from abortion? And that again, I, I'm, I didn't even know if I should say this because I don't want to detract or use that as a jumping off point to talk about this. That needs to be talked about. The, the issues of race need to be talked about on their own merits. And that is true. But for this discussion where we're talking about these meta issues, th that is, I, I don't know how one cannot put the two together and say, look, millions are dying. This is a, this is a, an issue that deserves that attention too. So I, I know I haven't really said anything too profound there, just to echo what John says, that's my um, now Northern way of saying amen, as I would have said in the South. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good point. I mean, even if we don't go all the way to abortion, which I think we should, I mean, that's one of the issues I'm very outspoken about. Um, but even if we say George Floyd, look, like everybody left, right, and center was against that and said, no, that's evil, that shouldn't have happened. But then all of a sudden when it's a black cop being killed by white Antifa, well, we're not gonna get in an uproar about that. Or even now the toddlers, black toddlers who are being killed by black lives matter activists it's like we're just we're just ignoring that and it's because it's for political things and again you strip the religious uh, underpinnings out from from the people and then give them a purpose to fight for it's like this is what happens on that um nevertheless we are happiness seeking creatures and i have found through practice and growing older that Acting gratitude, thinking gratitude, feeling gratitude makes me happier and seems to okay, kind of so rub off I, on other okay, people. So I, I don't, I don't think a... we are happiness seeking creatures. And I think it's a low goal, not because there's something wrong with being happy, because, you know, thank God if you get to be happy now and then. But I don't think that that's what we seek. I think we seek a meaning that's deep enough to sustain us through tragedy. And that is way different. Do you know, when I hit some, I, I, tragedy is too strong a word, um, I think... That, I'm, I, but if when I when I when horrible things happen to me, or I feel, or I read some terrible thing going on in the world, yes, those are tragedies going on in the world. Um, my response is, nothing matters. It's all empty and meaningless. This is how the world is. Get used to it. Get on with it, girl. That sounds like a very Zen Buddhist way of dealing. I guess with, it. I with, guess it is. Meaning. Well, it's a fun, it's a paradoxical way, though. It is the kind first, of paradoxical. The first part of that is nihilistic, and the second part isn't. So, well, how do you reconcile those two things? It, which, Why get on with it, girl? Because oh, oh, well. Here's another thing. I've often done this with my students. Let's suppose you become nihilistic. Uh, nothing matters. There's no point in doing. It. I mean, I think we live in a pointless universe. What are you going to do? And I say to them, like William James in his wonderful thing about getting up in the morning, um, but that's a slightly different point that he makes there. But I say to them, okay, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, think it's all pointless. I there's no point in doing anything. Now, what are you going to do? Well, actually, you're going to need to go to the loo. You're going to get out of bed and you're going to go to the bathroom. And when you're there, you'll think, well, oh, actually, I'm hungry. I think, well, I think I want to go down to the kitchen. Oh, I probably should put my slippers on. Why don't I get dressed? You go and have something to eat. And then you think... I'm bored. And you go to university and get into your lectures. And, you know, we are not creatures who will just not do anything. Exactly. Because as William Lane Craig points out, we can't live consistently. Atheists don't live consistently with their atheism. Um, and uh, to some something we were mentioning earlier, you know, she says uh, her naturalism is a naturalism that explains everything. But that's a very positive claim that we do, in fact, live in a very pointless and meaningless, meaningless-ness uh, or I think I might have said the wrong universe, but but either way, um, Braxton, yeah. Oh, I just thought that was 
a very honest expression of the conclusions of her position. But I think what it leads to is what you just pointed out, which is in the end, I do have this drive for purpose. Now we can give it to her on the going to the bathroom, right? Um, if we put on our naturalistic lenses, I mean, okay, I don't, I personally don't want to experience myself urinating on myself. So I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm hungry. So yeah, I'm going to go have some fruit loops or whatever they eat in, in Great Britain. But at the same time, um, I, uh, I'm going to go to university now because I'm bored. Hold on. You just jumped way down the track. Why are you going to go to university? That's much bigger than handling a carnal urge like eating or going to the bathroom. You're going to learn concepts because of what? Because you want to, because there's some drive to do something meaningful. Otherwise you wouldn't do that. And so what we do here is we say, look, couple of ways about this one that seems like some evidence right there that you do have this sort of teleological drive toward purpose and and that requires its own explanation but simply put we could go we, we could say something more we could say um we could borrow richard swinburne's um principle of credulity that he uses in his uh, argument from religious experience and say look you you have this you find in yourself this seemingness that you have purpose. It seems undeniable. That seems undeniable. Now, look, whether you take evolution or, or, or you're a young earth creationist out there or whatever you are, when I look at this hand, however this hand got to be a hand, it is. It clearly has a purpose for gripping things. My mouth clearly has a purpose for breathing and eating and talking. And those are some of my favorite things to do. When it comes to eating and talking, I'm a satisfied customer. My legs were clearly designed that I could walk around. They have a talos. They have a purpose that there seems to be. And it seems impossible to deny that I am built with purpose. Okay, if I have that sort of a seemingness, then it is. I am justified. Um, to to maintain that that is the case until someone presents me with an argument that has premises that are more plausible because a good argument has uh, premises that are plausible, more likely to be true than false. You need to present me with an argument that has premises that are more plausible to me than my immediate experience of purpose. And it's difficult to imagine such an argument with force like that. So I would say all of that unpacked from not the going to the bathroom, not the eating of the, the Great Britain style Fruit Loops, but the I'm going to go to university now because there I think you jumped way down the track. Yeah, Mr. Deflating Atheism. I, I knew you had gone away, but she essentially had, had made the argument, you know, we aren't just creatures. Yeah, I, 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 Braxton, uh, you did, uh, I loved everything you said. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say except to say that her worldview is horrible. And it seems like, it seems like her whole, uh, her whole, what would be a morality is just avoidance of suffering. And so I think uh, it's basically comfort for her. And so if, the, if that's, uh, if that's the highest good in her view, I would say the, why not just have a universal uh, euthanasia? I mean, if, if you're avoiding suffering. So yeah, I, I don't, there, there are deeper levels on which you can attack it, but yeah, it just seems like it's a horrible worldview to me. And I'm sure uh, she would look at the, uh, the couch potato who simply, uh, you know, goes to the, goes to the loo and eats her, eats his British uh, fruit loops. I'm sure she would look at him uh, with complete contempt, you know, if, if that's all he does. So I, I, I think she at some level uh, does feel that human beings need purpose too. Yeah, Dunphy. So I find it interesting, go to college if you're bored. I think if you have two people who are able to go to college and one is able to make a faster decision about what they want to do than the other person, the other person decides not to go to college, you clearly know that the one person who goes to that college has a sense of identity and purpose. They want to do something with their life. Not getting into metaphysics, whether you know God exists and whether that's pointless or you know has some sort of meaningful and God's, you know, purpose for your life and whatnot. And uh, the person who doesn't go and sits around wondering, what am I going to do with do with my life? And almost deep down, they have this sort of nihilistic tendency and they don't show it to others. They don't know what they want to do with their life because they, they don't have a sense of identity. They almost have to find their identity in others. And I, I think people who go to college understand um, education is very important. And when you have that value, you have a value in yourself and I think a sense of dignity, but I'm um, going back to God. I think, um, yeah, most certainly if, uh, 
atheism is true, the nihilism is true. But I know many Christians who are nihilists, and um, I, I, I think if we went to old books, we'd find many solutions and I'll not make assumptions, meaning, oh, they, they, they clearly didn't have answers in the past because we, you know, we, we were thinking about it more since we progressed more. No, I think Aristotle, one of his virtues is candor. And that is how I describe as realistic with reason. On, on the one hand, you have the over, what, what's the word for being over hopeful or um, over joyful for no reason? Huh? Oh, yeah. Over optimistic. And then you have complete nihilistic. Well, if you're candor, the middle ground between the two, you realize that, yeah, um, there are tough realities. Even in even in Christianity, you're going to go through certain struggles and it is just going to happen. But with your reason, you can realize, yeah, those emotions are a good thing and there's purpose to them. They don't make they aren't the truth makers, meaning uh, you're over optimistic and that becomes a worldview or, you know, they, there's no reason there's no truth vindicating in them, which would be the nihilist, where like emotions just don't have any play whatsoever. You know, the entire worldview is based off a sense of lack of hope and almost no rationality to it whatsoever. If you're a Christian, if you're an atheist, then yeah, that's justified. But um, I, I think Candor is from Aristotle a good solution to this middle ground, whether to be over optimistic or to be over nihilistic. Well, you can almost combine the two and realize, yeah, you're going to go through times of pain, and yeah, while you feel you feel like, yeah, there's no hope, but rash, rationally speaking, no, you're no hope since there is evidence that Jesus rose from the dead and is God, and so on and so forth. I know that in spite of a religious experience. But, um, yeah, I've, I've said my fair share, I guess. Yeah, if you don't have a, a sense of purpose, how are you going to endure struggle? Yeah. Me, to go through that process, which I've done in the past a lot, and it's just natural now, is... um. It is a, is a very positive way of living to accept the meaningless and ultimate emptiness of everything and accept that this creature here, this thing, this evolved creature just will get on with life. But, but, but you're not accepting the meaninglessness of it, even by going through those actions that you, you described. You don't think so? Not well, at all, because, you you're, because you're acting as if those well, things are meaningful. Yes, I am. I'm right. acting okay. as though those so things let, are meaningful. Are you pretending okay. so that they're meaningful? Pardon? Are you pretending that they're meaningful? No, I'm not pretending. I'm... I'm my way of putting it would be that those meanings are constructed by myself and others. They're personal and, and right. they're because, than, because but, of the kind of creatures we are, because of the meme, meme But they're plexus, not constructed. Because, I'd like to hunger hear your response to this. Neither is your desire to use the loo. None of that's constructed. No, no. But the fact that there is a loo <laughs> is part yes. of culture. Yeah, well, thank God for that. that. You know, yeah. yeah. But see, oh, you see, thank God we're using that. <laughs> Sorry, that's a poor joke. Well, you see, <laughs> see so imagine this. You, you have the proximal meanings that you described that are sort of a priori, right? Yep. They're handed to you. You might consider them as needs or drives, although they're yes. not. They're personalities. It's not the right way of conceptualizing them. Um, but, but then there's the intermingling of all those needs and drives, let's say. And that, that constitutes a new layer of structure because it isn't just that you have to eat and that you have to use the washroom and that you have to have something to drink and that you have to be warm enough or cool enough to survive. It's that you have to do all those things at the same time in a situation where you're going to have to propagate that across time and you're going to have to do it with a bunch of other people. Yep. And it's always been like that. And yep. so what that means is that out of those proximal meanings, higher meanings arise. And you might say, well, those meanings are arbitrary. And I would think I those are religious meanings. I wouldn't meanings. say they are arbitrary, but I would say they were constructed. It's very interesting. Reading well, your what book. What do you mean by constructed? Um, well, they are a consequence of, of mimetic evolution, of, of the language that, that people are brought up in, the culture they live in, the arguments they have. I mean, What about the... So... Real quick, so Rob, I'm, I'll keep a kick it over you first, but real quick, I want to say something uh, to your point earlier, uh, Braxton, when you kind of distinguish certain like biological desires, like to eat or whatever, from deeper purpose. I think yes, obviously, there's a distinction between them, but like what William Lane Craig points about morality, which is like if we trust our experience of the external world, we're no less justified in trusting our experience of uh, a, a moral realm. And so yes. In the same way, I think we're just as justified to trust, obviously, certain biological drives, and then our drive towards certain purposes you know but she made this make this argument that it is meaningless but this body will just won't just do nothing this body just will do things well going by that logic well hitler's evolutionary process led to him and he, he wouldn't just do nothing he would find his purpose and what he carried out or style and what he would carry out and then 
Two, back to the point you made earlier about, well, what are you going to do if you wake up and, and you're a nihilist and decide things meaningless? You're, you're going to go to the little and maybe you'll go to university. Well, maybe not. Maybe you'll take your own life because people do that all of the time who decide life is meaningless. Meaningless. I, I keep messing up that word for some reason. But um, yeah, sorry, Mr. Deflating Atheism. I, I don't really have a whole lot to add to that. I think I think uh, Jordan Peterson was actually building a, a more profound point than I was expecting at that point. But yeah, it seems like she wants to be the the woman who doesn't believe in purpose, who is inhabiting the structures of people who did, and that doesn't really work in the long term. Braxton. Yeah, I, I think it was a clear point. Um, you know, it strikes me that. Um, and I don't mean this as an insult to Jordan Peterson because I, I, I love Jordan Peterson, but I, I think he is saying in, a, in, in an eloquent and highbrow way what Christian apologists are saying in some of the most basic books about ultimate foundations and morality and meaning and things like that. It's, um, and it's great because it's getting to a different audience, but this is something that we've all said. Everyone on the screen right now has said, probably for years. So um, it's music to my ears. Senor Dunphy. Yeah. Um, I I think it's been overdone quite a lot. Not even in this podcast, but you know, atheists are living in consistent. Yes, I, I agree. Like um, epistemologically speaking, but like, yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think she's, just having her cake, um, just like many many atheists. But um, yeah, yeah. Biology that they're given. Well, we start with the biology, and the memes build on top of that. Now the memes are biology that. too. Well, by definition, they are well. See, this I, is the I thing. Would, this I would follow thing. Dawkins in saying, well, talk about genes as biology, talk about memes as culture. That's all I meant by dividing that. But let me say this. Yeah, Re but I don't accept that division. But I, don't I think want to get back to what we're saying division. about meaning. Well. Reading, reading your book made me think a lot about what, what you mean by meaning and your claim that we should have a meaningful life or strive for a meaningful life, that meaningfulness is important. And I kept asking myself, do I... Do I live that way? What meanings does my life have? And, you know, if I think of something like, well, the, most of my striving goes into writing my books. <laughs> and is that meaningful? And again, I have the same response when I ask myself that question. It's just what this body does. It, it, then it, you should listen to the body and stop listening to the thing that's criticizing it. And what would the body say? It would say, write your book and try to be as clear as you yeah, possibly can about it. Yeah, that's what I do. It. And that's right, exactly, exactly what I do. That's exactly what I said at the beginning, is that the atheist types act out a religious structure and no, criticize it. No, there's no religious well, structure. Oh, no, we let, come let get... So that's one of my favorite lines from Jordan Pearson, because it's, it's just like two sentences, but it's so profound, which is like, you have this instinct. Like if, you, like, if I had an experience of the external world, but then I had a worldview that told me it was an illusion, well, I should probably think there's something wrong with the worldview. And it's the same thing here. It's like she has all these instincts and drives drives towards certain purposes, but then has a worldview. And uh, you could say it's, it's the same thing with morality or free will, right? Like we all, we make free choices. We experience a moral realm, but then the naturalist just has this worldview that says, no, those things don't exist. It's like, well, maybe something's wrong with your worldview. But Braxton, I'll give it to you first. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is where I could almost be a bit of an idealist, though I'm not, and in, into saying that, look, the things that we have most direct access to are, are, are the... Um, are, are our experiences, are the qualia that we have. I mean, we, we have that direct access to our impressions of things. The external world are the things that we have access to via our senses. And that's why we always, in these worldview discussions, end up getting back to how do you know you're not a brain in a vat? Um, but the things that we have most direct access to are the things that we should be most confident in. And her impressions about morality and meaning and, and uh, all those kinds of things she has direct access to that so they shouldn't they should count for something and th this is one of the things that i get so frustrated about with uh, these worldview discussions which is there is such um there is such a reliance on empiricism and on science and scientism whether it, it is um ever explicitly that or not it, so that to the degree that we exclude experience and intuition as relevant guides for truth I liked it how I know you've had um, Trent Doherty on here before in his discussion with T-Jump. He said, 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes I mean, sometimes things aren't what, what they seem to be, but most of the time they are. <laughs> That's a really good point, you know. Like it's not. Yeah, our intuitions can be flawed. They can lead us astray. Uh, our strong, our strongly held impressions that certain things are true can lead us astray. But they're not always that way, and we shouldn't necessarily ha give them the default of distrusting them. So yeah, she walks around in the physical world. She sees this physical world. She functions in it, and she takes it all to be more or less the way things are. Well, in her, in the world of her first-person conscious experience, she shouldn't necessarily distrust everything as well, and it should count for something. Absolutely, yeah, Mr. Lithgow. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say. You were so okay. So yeah, we can be skeptical about things that we do have direct access to, but that the feeder would in turn have to be something that we have direct access to. We can't have some abstract principle to defeat uh, our our you know experiences. So uh, it kind of reminds me of of like a, somebody who criticized like a limitivist, a limitivist materialism and say, okay, you're you're constructing a mental model to disprove the mind that's constructing the model. It's, it's completely inside out thinking, but that, those are the kind of uh, contradictions that that naturalism is gonna lead you to. Now, when I look at this woman, it just seems uh, very, very distasteful to me because I think she's she's a writer, she has a pretty comfortable life. And so, you know, writing is what puts the roof over her head. And so she could just say, well, it's my body, I just wanna write. Well, that's very easy for her to say and so i don't really have a whole lot of respect for what she's saying hmm. Dunphy, i see you're typing would you like to add anything before i play the next clip uh not at the moment okay <laughs> this let, big me get, question let me get now. to this question because yes, i did have. want to get to this because you, you have a fascinating part in your book um, Jordan, where you, you do say this, you're simply not addressing atheists. You say you're simply not an atheist in your actions. And it is your actions. Or if that you are, look out. <laughs> and it is your actions that most accurately reflect your religious beliefs. What do you mean by that? Why, are you saying that no one is really an atheist deep down? I didn't say no one was. Okay. I said that most of the people who claim to be atheists aren't. So this is why I like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Because Raskolnikov tried to act like an atheist, right? He, he took the ideas that were floating around, Dostoevsky took the ideas that were floating around in the late 1800s, which are still the ideas that we're discussing today. One most fundamental idea, I suppose, being after Nietzsche's uh, announcement of the death of God, that if there is no God, then anything is permitted. That was Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov is the criminal in crime and punishment, the murderer. He gets away with his murder, uh, you know, technically, but not psychologically. And he decides that if there's no God, anything is permitted. But and this can't doesn't see have to be true. That's a that's a a, a, a person in a, a character in a novel. Um, I don't think that that's so. Well, let, let's hear the end of that story. And what 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 do you take away from what Dostoevsky has to say about? Well, Dostoevsky's takeaway was two: was that there was a moral law that Raskolnikov was breaking, even though he, he rationalized his way through it. Like he committed the perfect murder, right? Mm. He murdered a woman who people would have voted to murder, mm. and then he got away with it. And he did it for good reasons, at least re reasons that he could mm. rationalize as good. And then he got away with it, but it destroyed his soul. And, and Dostoevsky's right about that. And one of the things I like about Dostoevsky as compared to Nietzsche, say, because I think Dostoevsky is the profounder of the two, is that in, in the Brothers Karamazov, for example, Ivan is the atheist, and Ivan is everyone, everything you'd want a man to be, like seriously. And Dostoevsky, man, he doesn't straw man his opponents. The most powerful characters in his books are always the opponents of what he himself believes. And Ivan is always arguing with Alyosha, who's his younger brother, who's a monastic novitiate and really can't articulate himself very well, has nowhere near the force or charisma of Ivan. But Alyosha wins the drama, even, even though he loses all the arguments. And that's where Dostoevsky is so great. It's like, and, 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 and this is what you're doing in your life. But, you're you're acting. Look, you're acting out the logos, right. Susan. That's what you're doing. What, you're writing books to illuminate the world. Yes. You say, and well, I don't believe in that. Like, yes, me, of meaninglessness. Don't you think it's kind of uh, offensive to say to me that that I'm not an atheist when I am? I, I, I why don't answer me this question? Why do you think I don't go around murdering people? Because you're raised in modern Christendom. But uh, <laughs> Mr. Deflating Atheism, let me kick it to you first. I don't have a whole lot to say about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just, I just think uh, what what she's saying is ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Well, Braxton. 
Yeah. So um, the in the crime and punishment, for those that haven't read it, the guy does carry out it's I wouldn't call it the perfect murder. He just got really lucky. But he has this woman that he tries to, um, you know, he, she's like a loan shark. Basically, he, he goes or she's like a pawn shop. He goes to her apartment and he gives her things that he gets money in, in return for and that sort of thing. And uh, he, it comes into his head one day. Hey, I could kill her. She's got all this money and all this stuff in there. I could kill her and take all her stuff. And nobody would ever know because I could do it in the middle of the night and blah, blah, blah. And nobody likes her anyway. And so that's what he does. He almost gets caught by dumb luck. He gets out of it. And so he's safe. But then incredible paranoia and incredible guilt to the point that he just stays in his bed all the time. And people are trying to help him and give him money and try and he tries to get drunk and nothing will help. And he's just tormented. That's why I said earlier in the show, that is a great example of the depths of depravity. And it seems frankly, and I don't have anything against this woman. I'm sure she's a lovely person in real life, but, um, but it's just an oafish response to say back, well, but that's a novel. Well, okay. It is a novel, but you're telling me there aren't people like this in real life. Of course there are. Um, so, I mean, it, uh, it, it's a powerful, powerful, narrative now what she seems to miss that i think is very important in jordan pierce and she gets personally offended that he's saying that many of the people that claim to be atheists aren't atheists uh, but that's because she's thinking um that what he means by that despite his having clarified it earlier is that he doesn't believe that she intellectually consciously uh considers herself to be an atheist what he means is she doesn't live like an atheist that's why just a few moments earlier in the video he says and and we i don't remember how he put it but yeah we better hope they aren't really atheists he said know? he said or if they are look out <laughs> right and that's an important thing in you know in one sense it's one of the great things about jordan peter's conversations and his thinking is that there are layers to it. One of the most frustrating thing is that there are layers and you have to kind of learn how he communicates and what he thinks before you can unpack what he's actually trying to say. But I think that's a great example of where she tripped through and got offended at what she thought he meant. When I think he would say, yeah, of course I think you believe you're an atheist, but you don't live like an atheist. Yeah. And um, I want to make a point. We talked about this before we started the show, a, a brilliant point Steven Crowder makes. So she could just say, well, why do you think I don't go around uh, murdering people? And this is an, uh, an example atheists love to do as well. If you found out God, tomorrow God didn't exist, would you just run around raping and pillaging and doing all these things? And that's a very obvious example. And, you know, we know as, as apologists, we often argue, well, you don't need, say, God or the Bible to know murder is wrong, right? That's written on your heart. We have certain instincts. You know, but she could have asked the question instead of murdering, well, why do you think I go around forgiving people that have, have wronged me or showing mercy? Because guess what? For most of human histories and in most of societies, that was not seen as virtue. That is unique to modern Christendom. And that's because of the Bible, you know, love your enemies, pray for those uh, who persecute you. So that is a very uniquely Christian idea. And so to some extent, yeah, you do need a book to tell you uh, that those things are wrong. Yeah. And on those points and Rob, I see that you're about to say something. I didn't mean to cut you off, but um, I, I want to say real quickly, this may surprise people, but right now um, I, I'm in the middle of the most recent prequel to the hunger games, the book. And um, uh, w there's a great line in it where the main character who is president snow from the, uh, from the films. And he says something about the hunger games. He's thinking about the barbarism of it and just how, awful it is and the depravity and all these kind of things and he he muses in his thoughts about how if you just create certain cultural suggestions and you make them normative and you make them acceptable by kind of watering down and and, and normalizing this sort of behavior ultimately you can get a culture to do something like this and i feel a bit like S susan blackwell or black would say to me oh but but that's a novel Again, with the oafish response, I think my yeah. response would be, okay, but we have had that in the history of the world, something very much like the Hunger Games, right? So um, it, it just goes to show that, yeah, you, and this, this connects to the main theme that we've been discussing, which is, right, you wouldn't start doing horrific things tomorrow if you came to believe that God doesn't exist necessarily, because you live in a culture that has been infused with the suggestions of Christianity. But if you grew up in Pan Am or in ancient Rome or whatever, you very well could do these horrific things or allow for them or enjoy them because the culture allowed for that. 
a very good point. I, I was going to ask a question to to people who maybe study Jordan Peterson a little more than I do. So so Jordan Peterson he is here asserting that she's still using a, a sort of Christian metaphysical framework. So when Jordan Peterson says that he acts out Christianity, is he saying it in that minimal way that Susan Blackmore is acting out Christianity, or is it something more? Uh, I think, and then I think that's in the last clip. I, I think he's saying yes, there is something more because I, I think he does believe that there's a marriage of the two. That it's not just something pragmatic. That the the very reason that when we act those things out, you could like, you can say more or less you have a good outcome is because there's something fundamental built into reality. So I do think he goes further than I'm just acting it out because it's pragmatic. But the reason acting out the pragmatic thing will work is because there's something underpinning uh, reality. Gotcha. All right. So, yeah, we only have two more clips here. Each are only a minute long. So, Just come back to this because I want to hear why ultimately, despite everything that Sue said there, you still think she's behaving as though there is, in some sense, a God or some ultimate meaning, even though she protests that, no, that's... that's well, I would say she's acting it out. Well, for example, the act of writing a book. I mean, the Judeo-Christian culture is the culture of the book. It's, it's the revelation of the proper mode of being in written form. It's not only that, but it's, it's, a large, it's a large part of that. It's the culture of the book. You're acting out the culture of the book. It's thousands of years old. And the voice, the true voice in the culture of the book is the logos. That's what it is, technically speaking. And so she's acting out the logos and writing a book. It's like, and then she says, well, I don't believe in God. It's like, okay, that's the, fine. The logos, acting of course, in, like you do is fine. In, in scripture, in the New Testament is, is, the word. Brought, is brought into the word. And it, of course, it's relates the word to, that brings order and, out of and chaos. to Jesus Christ as, yes. as the sort of personification almost of that. Right. Uh, He's the archetypal manifestation of the logos. I mean, that's, that's... yeah. And real quick, but Jordan Peterson, by the way, wouldn't say Christ is merely an archetypal representation of that. I mean, Gary Habermas has talked to me about that before that, you know, Jordan Pierce is very open to there being more behind Jesus. But to the point Peterson just made, I thought this was a, a great overlay to put on. John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And that's Jordan Peterson's point. He's like, and that's what you're acting out in your life is the logos, especially particularly with someone who writes books for a living. So I thought that was great. Yeah, real quick, um, this isn't directly related, except that it has to do with his understanding of Christ. And um, I think I just want to share this because it's the most meaningful thing I've ever heard Jordan Peterson say. He said it on Joe Rogan's show, and he was talking about um, archetype, the archetype of the hero. And he says about, he says, if you take all of the best qualities that the best people you know share, and you boiled those down into one person, that would be your archetypal hero, right? That's a hero character. And then if you took all of the heroes who have ever lived and took the best qualities, leaving the worst, took the best qualities out of those heroes and boiled them down into one central figure, that's Christ. He's a meta hero. And I just thought, I, I get right now, as I just said it, I get the the prickly, you know, uh, what do you call them? Goosebumps, Goosebumps. Or whatever, because that is just powerful to me. And every Christian should think so, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Flaming Aces, did you want to say anything? Um, imagine, imagine telling your uh, 2005 self that one of the most profound things you ever heard was said on a Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I would know instantly it didn't come from Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor Joe. Um, no, one of the things, uh, if you saw the dialogue, uh, I can't remember the one, Rebecca Goldstein, I think it was, and William Lane Craig and Jordan Peterson all had a dialogue on meaning. And I thought one of the things Jordan Peterson said kind of along the same lines is he had a dream. And so I think God is really speaking to Jordan, but Jordan said he had a dream where there was all the great kings of the past. And then all of a sudden they all bowed down to the figure of Christ. Because even like the greatest kings need someone to, to bow down to, and I, I, to me, that was really profound. Jordan, Jordan has some for for someone who is not a a, a standard you know apologist, he has some really profound points that I think a lot of apologists could could really latch on to. Well, and a use. book that everyone should read, that everyone should read, should have to read, is um, uh, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, and I think in a lot of ways 
um, I think Jordan Peterson reminds me of a Benjamin Franklin type character, deistic as he was. Of course, to my mind, it's still somewhat ambiguous how to define Jordan Peterson, but um, but but I, he really reminds me of of Franklin. Mm. Yeah, sorry, I was just fast from the video. So this is the very last clip we shall play. Creation of church and state in one sentence. So there's a miracle for you. We're going to go for a final question. I, I'm going to ask it for both of you, which, which is the question we began with. We're talking about the psychology of belief. Do we need God to make sense of life? Um, your one minute answer begins now, Sue. Absolutely not. That will do for an answer. Okay. Do we need God to make sense of life, Jordan? Well, God is what you use to make sense of your life by definition. This is one of the things I learned from Jung. The highest value, you have a hierarchy of values. You have to, otherwise you can't act or you're painfully confused. You have a hierarchy of values. Whatever is at the top of that hierarchy of values serves the function of God for you. Now, it may be a God that you don't believe in or a God that you can't name, but it doesn't matter because it's God for you. And what you think about God has very little impact on how God is acting within you, whatever God it is that you happen to be, let's say, following. It's been fascinating. So there's a way to understand that I relate this because I think this comes very back to the beginning of the first clip we played when Jordan Peterson said, by no means are our beliefs transparent to us. Because there's a way to understand what Jordan just said as uh, more of a kind of idolatry type of thing. Like, well, if my highest value is this pen, then this pen is God for me. Or if this mug of water or this book, you know, is my highest value, then that's God for me. And that can almost sound like, again, this kind of just pragmatic thing. But going back to, I think what he's pointing out is actually, no, it's just not transparent to us that at some level, if you go deep enough, we are worshiping, say, the, the Christian God in the sense that we're, we're obeying our telos, which was built in by that God, so that God is the ultimate foundation, and we're obeying that telos. It's just not transparent to us by any means that the, the values that we're uh, obeying or, or living our lives by are built on that foundation. I think you're speaking to general revelation that we can see within ourselves about uh, the truth of reality. But I want to go back to something that I think Rob said earlier in the in the episode, which is that um, I think that everything you said is true and, and it's beautiful. I, I think there is there are still propositional truth claims that need to be held for someone to be in a meaningful sense, uh, an Orthodox Christian to be a Christian. And um it makes me think of the, uh, the the statement that is often attributed to St. Francis Assisi, but it's my understanding that there, that you can't demonstrate that Francis Assisi ever said this. And based on what we know about his life, it's unlikely that he would have said this as much as he preached the gospel. And that is um, that he said, um, preach the gospel if necessary, use words. I, I, I think that I don't think you find that in the pages of Scripture, except one place in First Peter chapter three, where women are, uh, whose wives are unbelievers, are told to just demonstrate the truth of Christianity to their husbands by the way they live their lives. In general, the gospel is proclaimed through propositional truth claims, and of course, we should have lives that reflect the truth that we're saying that we hold. But what I hope to see in the coming days from Jordan Peterson is. I love him. I think he's brilliant. I think he probably has a ridiculously high IQ. I think he sees a lot of wisdom, and I think, um, and it, it, and 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 I I can't judge his life, but I I hope to see in the coming days and years, um, propos clear propositional truth claims about Christianity, uh, because I do think that um, that that you have to hold certain beliefs to be true. Holding certain beliefs to be true doesn't make you. A Christian, because the demons hold right. many of those same beliefs, but they certainly should be there for anyone that is truly a Christian. Yeah, Mister Deflating Atheism. Oh, I mean, I think that's that's. I agree with everything Braxton just said. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we do have a, a, a intrinsic need for purpose, intrinsic need for meaning, and intrinsic need for God. I think uh, all forms of idolatry. Uh, are, are kind of mismatches. I think that is the telos that our, our urge for God meets God, not some not some idol. So, uh, yeah, that's about about all I have to say about that. Right on. And Senor Dunphy, it's been a while since you've spoken. I know you've been arguing with people in the comment section. <laughs> yeah. What do you have to say? Um, what I something I did comment in the comment section. 
I think obviously metaphysically, yeah, atheists would be living inconsistent and not applying their beliefs on how they live. But I think epistemically, God is so gracious that those who reject him consciously and just reject through their lifestyles and their choices and so on um, can value truth and virtue and live their life according to that. And in a way, it would be uh, indirectly being faithful or, you know, worshiping God because you're acknowledging those things. You're just not giving full credit in your belief systems and so on, but you can live according to those and have that sense of purpose. But uh, obviously be inconsistent with the entire worldview, but the potentiality is there to live like that, even as a non-believer, just like how um, you know, obviously non-believers live more morally than many Christians. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, we'll start wrapping things up. I do want to thank you guys very much for your time. I know this is this is almost on two hours now. Normally episodes are about one hour, but there was so much from that debate I really wanted to cover. So I really do uh, appreciate you guys taking the time, but are, are there any closing thoughts that uh, either of you have? Well, I kind of want to go back to what Braxton said about how, how he how he feels that that Jordan Peterson. Uh, I guess what you're saying is that he should he should uh, come to Christ, and so I, I think for the past whether three or four years, I think Jordan Peterson has been such a, a bridge, especially for kind of a disaffected young men who, who are really his target audience. I think he he laid a bridge for so many of them before before uh, things before the cliffs really started crumbling down, uh, and so uh, I, I think he kind of helped lead a lot of them to safety. If you guys kind of know what I'm saying, and I, I really hope that that Jordan Peterson himself uh, crosses that bridge. Well, you know that brings up a theological point that uh, Stellman and I were discussing before you guys got on the uh, on today, and that is that um, I believe that what God wants is for everyone to freely choose to accept Him. Um, but no, but I believe that knowing God obviously knows um, whether that's going to happen with Jordan Peterson, and if so, when, or if it's already happened, and I'm just confused about it or whatever, and. Uh, it's just like when, when anything that is not the way it should be turns out to be the case because of human choices, God can redeem that state of affairs and use it. Um, that's why we get the situation with Joseph's brothers in Genesis. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Um, like my brother, my brother is adopted and I don't think that God wanted the circumstances that led to his conception, but I think God can then redeem the situation and make something beautiful out of my brother's life. I think that uh, God would prefer that Jordan Peterson bend the knee to him in an obvious way now if he hasn't already. But if he's not, if he hasn't done that yet, I believe that God can use what Jordan Peterson is doing and the station in life he's in right now to affect a strategically good thing for the kingdom. And I think that kind of fits with what you were saying. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, to everybody out there, I want you guys to know that in the description are the links to Deflating Atheism's YouTube channel, uh, Braxton Hunter's YouTube channel, Trinity Radio, and there's also a link to the new Trinity Radio Extra channel down there. So people go over there, subscribe. Um, do you guys have any other places people can find you? I mean, I could say that if people want to uh, begin studying for their, uh, begin their theological journey oh, and go yeah. deeper, they can do that at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. You can do it just like you're watching this video right now. You can just do it sitting at home in your pajamas because uh, it's all online. And there are many people who have no desire to go into professional ministry who uh, do intend to, to go deeper in their study of the word. And they can do that at our school. You can get there at trinitysem.edu, trinitysem.edu. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity. And hey, I thank you for having me on the show today, Stellman and Absolutely. John. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and do you have any other places people can find you? Defining atheism. <clears throat> uh, I'm really uh, too busy. Uh, it's kind of a uh, craziness. Okay. Yeah, I have the YouTube channel. Uh, I've been having difficulty with the BitChute account. I've been having some bugs with uh, uploading my things to BitChute. Hopefully, I'll get that back up and an Instagram page. <laughs> That's <laughs> about. Yeah, and of course, there's a link in the description to John's uh, John Dunphy's YouTube channel. John, thanks as always for helping yeah, us. I, I I need to say something. Um, I think I changed my name to Braxton Hunter because I think I'm going to change that name because I look more like a Braxton Hunter. Braxton Hunter looks like Vin Diesel. So, ah, I'll take it. <laughs> By the way, if we ever do this again, we're all going to be in Braxton's room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or, or your room. Or your room. I'm all for it. 
<laughs> we'll see. Yeah, and, and just real quick, last thing, if you guys want to support this ministry, uh, subscribestart.com slash TUA. Um, you can subscribe there for 10 bucks a month. You get access to all the bonus content, web extended, and more. But if you can't do that, I totally understand. But what you can do for absolutely free is subscribe to this channel, click notification bells, because subscriptions don't mean a whole lot. And uh, again, thank you to Deflating Atheism, Dr. Braxton Hunter. And I'll see everybody next time.